personal projects, having space to put things and rooms to record things and stream from and all that good stuff. Yeah. So you're, <laughs> what's your commute then for that? Uh, it's, you know, it's about, it always doesn't feel super long, but it's about 40 minutes. It's usually okay. between 30 and 40 minutes. That's not horrible. Cause you're, you're in Grand Rapids still, right? Mm hmm. Yep. And, uh, you know, there's, there is like my friend, uh, was moving out of her apartment, but it, you know, I would need a little bit more money per month to like try and make it work. It, you know, it's, I'm, I'm splitting a rent with two other people in a house right now. And it, you know, it's, we're paying like three eighty five a person. Is that the house that I crashed at for like a night? Yes. <laughs> Hell yeah. <laughs> remember that spot <laughs> yeah it's i uh you know i'm i'm i was thinking of my next move at the time before the pandemic and then when it hit i'm like ah, this he said my rent's not going up so i'm staying yeah, here right how about that <laughs> but, yeah all all plans for moving and all that are irrelevant when your job got eradicated <laughs> Yeah, just like, t just you know, I I was I had been working at Founders, and then it was a weird like, you know, like everybody, you know, didn't matter if you're on the sound team or the you know in the tap room, they they were like, okay, well, it's you know we're gonna have to shut down for a couple months, and then you know some people got to go back to work. The music team got furloughed for you know, I think from May until October. And then in October, they were just, they just fired everybody. <laughs> so there's no music team at Founders. And I'm like, eh, I don't know when they're going to start doing anything. <laughs> yeah. How that works. But I'm also like, I, you know, I, it, I wasn't making a lot of money. There were some benefits from it. And mm. I liked, you know, just working in shows and stuff. But unless like a couple people from the team return, I don't think I'll consider it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I feel that. I have enough going on. Yeah, I, I mean, I feel like everyone kind of uh, got creative in terms of like how to make money if they can't play shows and stuff. And I feel like now that people have kind of settled into it, they kind of prefer it. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. it's like oh i can make the same amount of money and i don't need to leave my house <laughs> like amazing like <laughs> sign me up you know <laughs> yeah well and and you were kind of one of those people that i saw because you you did i feel like pretty early on in terms of like the people you know in our age range that i was observing like not just saying like oh i play drums it's like you you got miking equipment because you had an interest in engineering and you learned how to like track for like as you're tracking for a client you're also shooting video and and editing that and putting it up on youtube like it you there's never just like oh i do one thing and it's done it's like this one moment is four different things that could potentially come from it <laughs> yeah well i mean that yeah i mean i guess i kind of like i never really when I first started doing it, I didn't really think it was like a, like a marketing, you know, whatever. Right. I just was like, cameras are cool. <laughs> Drums are cool. Let's put the two together. You know, like I didn't really think it was anything other than that. And then, you know, I guess like over time, you know, with how things have kind of shifted in terms of like how you market yourself as a, musician on the internet it's kind of i mean it's almost required at this point that you have some sort of visual element to your product not right. just for like i mean not just for like me as a drummer but i feel like you know even like bands and stuff like music videos and all that stuff's like pretty crucial to have some sort of visual element but i mean that that wasn't like i definitely didn't do it as some as someone that was like saw the future and was like this is the thing i was just like yeah this is cool <laughs> you know like yeah well it, it's you know the happy accident then i guess like you you 
built all those skills when all you know probably some of your other friends have saw you like doing it years before and when all of this hit they're like how how do you what's obs or like how do i set up a how do i sync audio and video like it's not working yeah i mean i still get questions like that from homies all the time but (laughs) (laughs) especially especially now because it's like i have nothing else to do i might as well learn how to do these things right but you know it didn't it never it never was a thing for me that was like i don't know it was always just like for fun and then it ended up becoming work which i guess made it more fun because it was like oh i'm actually getting like money to do these things now so that's that's cool (laughs) yeah hey that's that's great i get paid to spend hours tweaking settings on a camera and (laughs) figuring out what looks nice and i mean now i don't even i barely like i don't really i don't really mess around that much with that stuff just because i've kind of found like i mean every so often i'll like futz with things but i kind of just set it and forget it at this point yeah you know when you you have like because like does sam for aviations take point in a lot of the video stuff with his background or um well i mean for my personal stuff like i mean i definitely uh set and forget reach out to him and i'm like hey does this look like garbage or not and he'll usually give me like a seven paragraph answer (laughs) so uh i mean i definitely he's definitely like my mentor in terms of like that kind of stuff right um just because that's what he does with his life so it makes sense that's that's free advice uh but i mean yeah i mean with all the aviation stuff he uh is definitely like the point man because he's free and amazing so <laughs> i mean that outliers video looks absolutely absurd so yeah. you know like yeah like that's <laughs> yeah why wouldn't you take advantage of sam if you if you every band every every like group of people that function together in a working collective deserve a sam basically like <laughs> yeah i i'm not you know I'm not in terms of the visuals. I'm not a Sam, but I feel like I'm the Sam for Earth Radio, just trying to help people get used to, you know, that it's not just when we're on stage. And it's not just when we're in the studio. Like, there's plenty we can do <laughs> to like support the band and support like what you know we're trying to build. And you know, thinking about the holistic release of a thing rather than just like you know this was cool. And then you stick it into the ether and then no, nothing comes of it or you don't do anything with it. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think we all still wish that was the case, but I mean, like even with this brand of sacrifice release, like there, I mean, I feel like the songs have been like the smallest part of like the entire release, you know, like we did like a, an album release party that was like, 8,000 viewers and like uh you know we gave away like a ps5 we had like sponsors we did like all this stuff that was like to uh support like the music but like that stuff i feel like takes almost more work than like writing and you know tracking a song so it's like you know i guess that's kind of the vibe in 2021 (laughs) Yeah, it's like there's so there's so much you have to like push through in terms of just l- getting people to know it exists, and then yeah. once you have their eyeballs, it, you have you know you have like two seconds on Instagram to keep their attention, and yeah. <laughs> well, it's just like main. I I think like the the thing that I've kind of realized, you know, is like anyone can like write a song anyone can you know learn a song and cover it on the internet but it's like yep people are people especially now like when people haven't really like left their house in like a year people are like looking for like i feel like a closer social connection to the to the content they're viewing on the internet and i feel like if there's a way that you can do that that isn't like super campy that like people really respond to it 
you know? And I think that that's, I think that that's kind of like a way that bands are kind of shifting less towards just being like guys who play instruments and write songs into like more ways that bands are kind of like shifting to the role of like a more formal, like content creator kind of path, because that's a really nice way for a band to kind of stay in uh in a person's like peripheral vision in terms of like being around and it's really like i i feel like you know in terms of bands that want to like keep that like mystique kind of band persona there's a way that you i feel like there's ways that you can you know keep up like your presence and communication with fans and people without it being like hey check out my song you know like right (laughs) that super corny garbage that we all hate you know yeah it's that's that's been like you know with trying to think of trying to you know market earth radio in a way that you know it it feels genuine to how we make stuff and interact with people but also knowing that we're kind of this you know misfit conglomeration of sounds and styles that some people at least you know we've only been a band like we're coming up on our fourth year as a band but um just seeing you know like some people are like oh it's like a psychedelic jam band it's like no well it's kind of like a neo soul like like proggy band well no it's kind of like a <laughs> you know, like a fusion rock group, like it, you know, there's, everyone's got their labels for what we do. Dude. I remember that show that we played together. Oh yeah. At that, uh, shit. What was the name of that bar in Grand Rapids? Uh, uh, the tip top deluxe. Yeah. They have old style there. That's the one thing I remember. I remember drinking a lot of old styles with my dad at that bar gig, but dude, I remember that show specifically. Cause like, I think, you guys played and I was just like, dude, that was disgusting. <laughs> I was just like, this is, I remember just sitting there with Adam and Richard and just being like, it's like, damn, like we picked the wrong genre boys. Like we playing shit like that. <laughs> well, and, and that was like, after you guys, like, I mean, you had literally just like a, a live rig in a box where you could just like, run your own show you could you know you had everything mapped out mic'd up just like this very like you know professional looking operation and then you you know all this all the the sounds and things you were weaving in and out of and we were just like whoa <laughs> it's like yeah i think we had a light or did we bring a light rig for that tour i think we did yeah <laughs> yeah i remember that that was not fun to put together and it well, and, you know, like Tip Top was an interesting venue that would like they took. It was so funny because they took the show and they kept like they were like, "Hey, you know, we've been having issues with the noise complaint." I'm like, "Did you listen to any of the bands?" That... It's like Tiny yeah. Tree is two large men with even larger stacks of amps. That's right. Yeah, <laughs> and then... I remember that being a particularly loud evening. <laughs> Yeah, it was it was it was really fun, but I I just that's so funny. Like they were having these complaints, and then they book a show that's like, you know, like the two loudest bands. bands. And <laughs> yeah. yeah, I remember that tour just because I think that was, I think the the show that we booked was like a routing date. It was it was a routing date back to Boston after the tour we did with Outrun. Oh, okay. So we did that show and then we did another show. No, I think we did that show. And then we stayed at my parents' house for a bit and then uh, like a day. And then we, we drove like all the way to Philly, played a show in Philly. And then we made it home. And like, oh. I remember getting home and just being like, I slept for like a day and a half straight. <laughs> just like, yep. All right. Sick. <laughs> did it. All right. Uh, just, yeah, that, uh i remember the um you know that 
being like such a weird, you know, a, a weird combination of things that is like, like wanting the show to happen, but then also, you know, being like, oh, I wish, you know, there's a, a little bit of a different space just because of how tiny the, the room was. But then, you know, digging everything that was happening is, you know, just kind of bands being mutual fans of each other. And then, you know, not many extra people being there is like a, you know, like any show. You, it's like, man, I wish that, you know, a crowd would have showed up, but everyone sounded great. But I wish that, you know, <laughs> in hindsight, but. I think um, it was also like on a Sunday or something. Yeah. So, I mean, and that was a tough market for us because I think we, we played Detroit like four weeks earlier. So it was like, like that, I think that show we drew pretty well. And then it was like, well, I don't think we're going to draw all those people again because we literally just played. Yeah. It's like, maybe I was hoping that, you know, like some of the, the GR and Muskegon metal fans would try and come out to support, but yeah. It's well, they will after the pandemic because there haven't been shows for a year and a half. Yeah. <laughs> Come on out to the show. Um, oh, I was also thinking without running the sunlight, uh, my um, friend uh, Luke got to be their new drummer. <laughs> oh, yeah. I talked to him <laughs> on the phone the other day. Oh, nice. Yeah, he's a nice dude. I didn't realize this because I, I just tracked drums for the latest Outrun record, actually. Oh, really? Um, before they got Luke. Um, and I didn't realize it, but I was talking to Austin, their guitar player, and he was like, because uh, he hit me up. Luke wanted to know some stuff about like recording. And so I like called him on the phone. And then I called Austin. I was like, yeah, Luke's super nice, man. Where'd you find him? And he was like, I found him on your Facebook when you posted about my band needing a drummer. And I was like, that's hilarious. Like, <laughs> you're welcome. I'm glad I could do that for you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was, and, and and to have him like, because I had been, you know, Earth Radio did a tour with um, Luke's band. Um, oh, what's his band? He's got like a funk fusion band, uh, Spocket. Mm. And we did like, I think, four days in Illinois, just different spots. And um, that was super fun. And then I had forgotten on that tour, I had known Luke, you know, he had come up to Grand Rapids for certain shows. And I was like, oh, yeah, you were playing with these folks at this spot. And yeah, it's just these weird connecting threads that just somehow happen. <laughs> I mean, the older I get, not that I'm like an old man or anything, but like the older I get, the 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 more I realize how like hilariously small the music industry is. Mm -hmm. Like, it's just like, it's honestly hysterical to me how just <laughs> tiny it is. Like, I can't remember that. I have a realization about it like once a week, but it's just every, you know, it's just like, oh yeah, I know you from this thing I did 10 years ago or, you know, something like that. It's just constantly, I'm constantly like re-meeting people that I met like 10 years ago or something. A lot, I mean, a lot of it's like Berkeley related, but right. I feel like, I feel like the, I just keep getting reminded that the music industry is not this like giant vast vacuum of thing there's just like i just keep seeing the same people a lot <laughs> maybe that's just me but no i i feel like you know even being like you know based in grand rapids and you know seeing you know like having moments where like oh i went to the bang a can summer music festival and that was in massachusetts or like i went to la for this week-long you know jazz intensive at cal arts or you know, just these random things I've just bounced around and done. It's, you know, seeing those connections of like, oh, that guy's like drumming with this artist I had been listening to, didn't realize he was the drummer for it. Or like, you know, seeing people go from just being like, oh, yeah, that guy I met at camp to doing <laughs> doing it's something that's like, oh, there's there's not only still going, they're like thriving. Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. It's great. 
Because that was us, right? I met you at Blue Lake. Yes, I I think yes, because I I distinctly remember you and Matt, Matt Ryan. Yep. Playing like liquid tension experiment <laughs> in our cabin <laughs> at fucking jazz camp. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And just, I just remember that so vividly because our counselor was just trying, like, oh like, oh, let's get the, let's have a talent show, and then you guys just go into this like ten minute long. Oh know. my god, dude! <laughs> oh my god! <laughs> oh, that was, oh man. <laughs> oh, good old. We, I, Matt, and I excelled at being the oddest friend pair at that camp. Like we just did not like, I don't know. Maybe I would like to think we were just more big brain than everyone else. But like, we just did not care about like being jazz snobs or like being classical snobs. We're like, no dude, we like everything. Cause we would like, we would hang out in the cabins and stuff and be like, we'd listen to like Stanley Clark for 30 minutes. And then we'd put on like, mashuga or something right and we th- we'd have the same like face of like this is sick the whole time yeah. and it, like, <laughs> it was so funny because people would like you know come and hang out with us if we we're listening to, like victor wooten or stanley clark and then be like yo like uh let's put on some uh like some dragon force and people would the people half like half the people would leave and then like a new group of people would come and be like oh yeah dragon force is cool and they'd be like all right yo let's put on some uh avishai cohen and then they'd be like, all right, I'm out. <laughs> <laughs> Just like, all right, that was fun for one tune. All right. Yeah. <laughs> Don't like this. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's funny. It's actually funny, like, how I, like, Blue Lake was so essential for me. And just in terms of, like, that was, like, a really good taste of, like, learning that there's other because i mean where i grew up in michigan was like a really small town and i was always like the best kid in whatever drum related thing not because i was really that spectacular but just because i was like the only one that cared like a lot (laughs) you know what i mean and then when i went to blue lake i was like oh there's actually other kids that care and then but blue lake i mean blue lake is amazing but blue lake was definitely on like a smaller scale in terms of like the amount of kids that were like, I mean, I don't think a lot of kids at Blue Lake ended up being full-time musicians. You know what I mean? Like, no, but there was definitely like a, there was a, the, the level was increased from like my middle school to going to Blue Lake in terms of like the quality of the players. And then, and then when I went, I think I was still going to, I think I went to Blue Lake like five years, four years. Okay. I don't know. I mean, my parents spent a stupid amount of money on me going to that dumb camp, but <laughs> <laughs> but uh but it was like really it going there first of all made me a way better jazz player not that i play a lot of jazz at this point but uh it made the transition from going there to berkeley like a hell of a lot smoother because i was already used to like being in an environment where like i was pretty sure i wasn't going to be the best right but instead of being like Oh, like getting all up in arms about it. Just be like, all right, who's the best dude? And can I be friends with them? Right. You know what I mean? So that like, I mean, that camp was so helpful for me in terms of just like getting exposure to people that were my age that were good. Cause I wasn't, I mean, I wasn't getting that. I, I wasn't challenged in any music capacity. Like, in my schools right up until my senior year of high school wow. i was never the only challenge that i was kind of brought with and with, again not saying that i'm like a god it's just like the arts programs in my in my public schools were absolute trash shout out to reed city high school uh <laughs> peace and love uh reed city high school come at me bro uh <laughs> The only challenge that was really brought on me was like from my parents kind of finding like, you know, the all state programs and like solo and ensemble and like uh, they researched like getting me. I marched with the U of M marching band when I was in high school for a bit just because there was like a program where high school kids could come and do that. 
And like all that stuff was like through my parents just being like, you should do this. You should do this. You should do all these things. Also, don't fail your math test. Like, <laughs> you know. There's 30 things to do. And if you fail math. But it was never the, it, I mean, it was never like it wasn't, I, I, I don't want to say it like it was something that my parents were like, my parents were not like strict about it. It was just like, do you want to do these things? And I was definitely like a yes man for all that stuff just because it was, you know, it was, it was that or like play video games. So, you know, the one story I have though, that's bad funny about that is my senior year uh, of high school. I was in it, every day was a music thing after school. Cause I was, uh, we did drumline on Mondays and then I had jazz rehearsal on Tuesdays and then Wednesdays I had jazz rehearsal at a college nearby. And the reason I got into the college jazz band, because my dad told me about it because the jazz band at my high school was like red band at blue Lake tier. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. For those of you that know what I'm talking about, yeah, <laughs> it was not good. <laughs> so and I would just like, didn't, I wasn't having a good time. So my dad was like, well, why don't you audition for like the college jazz band? And I was like, well, cause I'm not in college and I'm sure there's like a dude in college who wants that. And he's like, well, just ask. And I was just like, no dad, you're being dumb. Like stop being dumb. Yeah. So I get home from school one day and my dad just like, I think we're having dinner. And my dad's just like, hey, by the way, you got a jazz rehearsal. You got a jazz rehearsal audition tomorrow at uh, at uh, Fair State. And I was like, what are you talking about? He's like, yeah, I called the school and pretended to be you. And I asked if I could play in the jazz band. <laughs> <laughs> so, so my dad legit just called this university and was like, yeah, hello. I'm a 18-year-old, 17-year-old James Canoral here. Uh I would like to uh, participate in your uh, extracurricular jazz band activities. Like, oh my God. And I, I think, I think my, uh, my dad told me at the dinner table and I don't think my mom knew either. And my mom's just like, Tom, you did what? And I was just like, this is amazing. So that's how I ended up in this college jazz band. It was actually great because the, it was again, another one of those things where it was like, it was people that were better than me. Yeah. And I was just like, I'm just here to have a good time. You know, I'm just here to like learn stuff. And there was, there actually was another drummer in the, uh, in the ensemble, but he was like the nicest dude. Like he was just the nicest guy. Cause I've had experiences before where like when I was in middle school, I used to play with the high school pep band and drum set, you know, like in the, it wasn't, it wasn't a warm reception. And then yeah. like with it and for this, I was kind of the same thing. I was kind of worried like, oh, you know, this guy's going to get mad that this like kids coming in like and rightfully so, you know, I'm not like paying tuition or whatever, but he was like, oh, yeah, cool, cool kid. Like it's kind of it's kind of fun. Yeah, I was going to college parties when I was a senior in high school. So that made me a cool kid on in high school. So that yeah, that that's your street cred for <laughs> all your high yeah. school friends. Yeah. Right. (laughs) Yeah. Wow. That's like a lot of the things you were saying, it it reminded me of like, yeah, you know, being a yes man in high school doing, you know, I I could only go to Blue Lake really if, you know, like my parents would, they, they would help pay for some of it. But at the time I was doing, you know, more competing. So there would be, you know, these piano competitions that, to be eligible, all you had to do was show up to like, you know, th- they would have these like weekly music clubs where like a guest would come talk about something and do a little performance. And then students of area teachers could use it as a way to perform. And I think you had to attend. Yeah, you had to attend a meeting and you might have had to perform at a meeting to be eligible. But I would just do those competitions and the three times I went to blue lake were because I got three scholarships from these competitions. Hell and yeah. I was just like, you know, that was, was that first time of being like, yeah, like, like, Oh, I have a skill that's going to get like, I could use this to get access to other cool yeah. things I like doing. And then blue lake was 
yeah, that first time being like, oh, there's other people who also, you know, play music more than, you know, once a week or, <laughs> yeah, you know, actually practice their instrument. You can play and, and, yeah, have fun with it rather than kind of just being like, yeah, I play music. What do you do? Well, I just bought a guitar. It's like, <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> Not that that's a bad thing, but it was like, I, I, you know, like I'm sure, I mean, I remember having those experiences when I was a kid of just like, I mean, that is why me, Matt and Evan and I were like best friends when we were kids, because like, again, not that we like, I mean, we, I thought we were pretty special for our age, but like, right. We were the only kids that like, I mean, I remember back in the day when we were like 12, 13, like my parents used to like, we'd go to Detroit, pick them up, come back to my parents' house and we would legit play. We would practice together for like eight hours a day for like three days. And we were like, this is fun. (laughs) Like we would sit and practice together for like eight hours a day. My mom would like make us pizza and I was like, that was our idea of a good time was just yeah. like, let's learn dream theater songs. Like, yeah. and we used to like make, like, I remember like before hangouts, we'd be like, yo, I learned the guitar part to this one. Can you learn the drums? Yo, I learned the piano to this one. Can you learn that? And I'm just like, this is insane. But I like, <laughs> I remember that, that being at Blue Lake and just like finding those people because like before, you know, in your small town or whatever, at least for me, it was like, you know, if you're the music kid, you have to hang out with like the other music kids. And in my experience, hanging out with those people, it wasn't, it was more like they weren't, they were kind of music kids by like, because they thought like the image of being a music kid was cool. They weren't actually good. You know what I mean? And good relative to being like 16 you know what i mean so i wasn't like gaining anything by like playing with these people i was just like man i wish you cared as much as i did like yeah so that's why i like going to blue lake and like being in the all that extracurricular stuff was so like i mean that to me that was like the reason that i actually probably got into music because it was like oh there actually is people that care about this like dumb nerdy thing and want to like take a military approach to (laughs) (laughs) being a musician yeah and just having like because as as a as a pianist i felt like you know be a lot of the musicians you tend to interact with you know you might meet some of them at your school and you might have like you know like oh i picked up clarinet now i'm in band or i picked up cello and now i'm in orchestra And you get a little taste of like, okay, they're pretty good at cello. That's not my main instrument, but I'm going to learn from them. Or like, oh, they're better than me at a woodwind. I'll try and learn from them and get better at clarinet. But um, most of the time is just, you know, interacting with like, oh, these are the people that also study with the guy I study with. And we have studios. And But yeah, to have, you know, more people who are like, they're thinking of music outside of just like oh I, you know my teacher gives me this i learn it and then you know <laughs> i feel better <laughs> i get an a my mom gives me 50 dollars. i buy the new madden game yeah <laughs> it's, it, yeah it's it's learning more about like like oh they i can if i keep keep at this i'm going to find more people like this and yeah. it's going to be easier to like have the people and the, you know, the resources and, you know, I can hit up different people if like, Oh, I need a bass player. I need a, you know, a drummer or whatever. Like it, it becomes less, less hard when you're, you're open to playing with all more people and learning more music styles. And I don't know. Yeah. I mean, well, I think, I think like when I went to Berkeley five week, um, was kind of like I realized that man you just have to be like as sociable as possible like I think I take after my mom like I'm usually the loudest person in the room and I'm just like I just like talking to people like 
the first thing I'm going to do when COVID is done and like I can go back to normal life is I'm just going to go to a bar and I'm going to talk to the bartender about nothing for about 45 minutes. And it's going to be the greatest time. But like, you know, just being able to like when I was at five week, the, one of the first presentations we went to was like the guy, the spokesperson said, you know, there's 3000 kids here you should have 3000 new phone contacts in your phone before you leave. And you should have like Dutcher piano, like in your phone, like what their name, where they live and their instrument. Yep. Yeah. And I, I, when I was, I remember I got that information when I was like 17, I still use it to this day. I still do that. And it like, cause uh, you know, fairly often people hit me up for, for uh hey like hey do you need it you know bass player do you know a vocalist and i like to i like to stir the pot you know like i like to like give work to different people every time just because you know different work requires different stuff so i'm always like going through my phone like bass player and then i'm just like oh yeah i remember this guy he was good he'll be good for this or whatever but like that's like something that just being like super social and just like being able to like, you're only going to benefit from being able to like talk to as many people and not be like creepy and weird about it. You know? (laughs) Yeah. It's I say social. I don't mean like add me on Facebook and tell me to like your band, you know? (laughs) (laughs) DM for a feature, like DM for a feature. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. That not that. I mean like actually being a person. Yeah. Which, but also though is like really hard to do right now because yeah. like you know like i don't think i've really met it's not like i've really nurtured a lot of new relationships in the music industry since covid happened because you know i i can't i don't have the opportunity to like where am i gonna meet people like yeah where <laughs> you know like before with before the city closed down you know i was going to jams like twice a week and is meeting people and it was sick and i was like all right like there's plenty of things to do and now it's like all right well uh what do i what do i do what do i do like you know (laughs) who's out there (laughs) yeah it's well and it's interesting here you know grand rapids is like it's you know on the slow development climb well i feel like it's sped up in the last couple years but you know, venues like the listening room that have popped up in in Grand Rapids didn't exist, you know, three years ago. Yeah, I was gonna say I don't even know that one. Yeah, and it's like, you know, the list in terms of like utility and like the vibe, it's one of the one of my one of my favorite spots in the state because it's equipped it doesn't matter where you sit in the room the way the speakers are arranged it's like really easy to get a good mix whatever ever spot in the room um it's all kind of you know like a chicago club style where there's a stage and then everything kind of focuses in on the stage oh it's kind of it's i mean it's kind of it sounds like it's like bitter end yeah it's yeah yeah, it's like it's it's got you know a, a mix of like the the chill relaxed vibe of like oh it could be you know like right now it's a dining space for the restaurant that's beneath it um it's like oh it could be dinner music vibe it could be you know put 200 seats in you know comfortable seats and have the bad plus play two nights and and then it could also be oh well they're doing outdoor shows in the courtyard like there's there's a lot of flexibility um and it also the whole complex is owned by celebration cinema so there's money to like really make it a good space um and that you know it opened end of 2019 so there was like maybe three or four months of shows and then the pandemic hit and they were closed Uh. like a year (laughs) and i think they did like six shows outdoors or something like just ones they knew they could like you know accommodate whatever the city was saying and you know get enough people interested in buying tickets but 
yeah it's yeah when was your when was your last show um well interestingly enough the listening room has had me doing uh they call it dinner music but it feels like you know i'm doing a show while people are having dinner um so it's not as much background but i've been doing i did three weekends of of solo piano and i just did a trio weekend uh friday saturday last weekend and i'm doing a different trio this friday saturday and it's like there's a little bit of a residency with it but it's also super like you know i'm i'm reminded that it's very likely it, it won't go into the summer <laughs> but we're just kind of playing it by ear so that's been a, a you know a recent development within the last like three weeks but before that you know it was like i think earth radio got paid like you know a couple hundred bucks to like play in a garage somewhere in cedar springs <laughs> And it was like, okay. okay, there's like 40 people. It's like, I, I haven't done this vibe in a while. It's, you know, it's fine. We haven't done a lot of shows. And then that was, yeah, like October. So it was, and that was, you know, I think we had done once a month at Rake Beer Project for like four months. And then we had one show with the city that didn't get rescheduled. Because mm -hmm. um, it was outdoors, I guess. But Wow, so you've actually been gigging quite a lot. <laughs> yeah, it's it must be nice to live in a state that doesn't care about your health. <laughs> <laughs> I know that's it. that. Well, and it's so weird because, like, it you know, the, you, if you were to talk to, I mean, people were literally like going to Lansing to overwhelm the Capitol building. Like, oh yeah, I remember that. I remember. I remember that. And yeah, I remember, I remember I, calling my mom and being like, "Man." I dodged the bullet not living there anymore. <laughs> yeah, just like, what is happening? I was, like, calling my brother who works in Lansing. I'm just like, are you – do you see any of this on Dude. your commute? Or, like, what's happening? Dude, I mean, I I mean, I I can't really make fun about New York – New Yorkers that much because I've only lived here for, like, two years. But right, I'll take crazy uh, – I did live in Boston for 10. So I'll at least say I'll take crazy Tom Brady fans over whatever – weirdo strain of like conservative redneck hoodlum you guys got in lansing <laughs> yeah that uh, and, you know driving up it was also weird having like because I, I i play with um blue water kings band it's you know it's like a branch of mm -hmm. that i don't know yeah wedding corporate band stuff and you know a lot of my I, I play a lot of shows with a lot of my friends in the roster it's you know very chill and to have, I think I ha I still had like ten weddings, and they were all the vibe. The, the vibe was like, "Hey, I have enough money to, you know, basically pretend it doesn't exist." <laughs> and I would see like, I remember playing a wed. I, there was a wedding I had in August where the the bride and groom that got married at that wedding that was kind of like, you know they just got really drunk and they just kept yelling at us to play stuff at on Spotify instead of us playing our set. <laughs> um, they, they were at another wedding and that this wedding, it was like a private, you know, some nice house on a little inland lake. And they, they showed up. Some of the same people were at both weddings. And then that wedding we had to, you know, we, we had in our contract that we could shut it down if like we didn't feel that they were respecting, you know, just the very basic guidelines. And they were like, you know, they, they would like, <laughs> they, they would jump on stage during the break and like try to play our instruments. Like it was like a karaoke hour. <laughs> and I'm, you know, at some point we were all just sick of it. And, and one of the singers was like, Hey, uh, we already, you know, we played our three sets. We were going to do an encore. We already got paid for the encore, but literally as i'm saying this there's like f you know four guys like trying to get up into my personal space and like sing into the mic and they're all just rowdy and drunk <laughs> and we canceled and it was it was that weird moment where of like like we got paid the client overall was happy they understood why we canceled 
but it was still like super weird that you know they kind of let it get to that point <laughs> yeah my so. most i mean i haven't played it i haven't played a show what's the date today march 9 i think all right <laughs> i i think the last show i played was exactly a year ago whoa the last like real show i mean i played i played over the summer in in the village outside yep but those were like you know not i just did those because i was like i need to play with people like i need to like (laughs) my body is withering you know like i need to i need to see people with instruments on their bodies (laughs) making music so i can feel alive um (laughs) The last, but the last real show I played was a year ago, which is insane. Wow. And that's like, cause it, you know, like people that are going to check out your bands will be like, Oh, you know, like, like what pickup gigs do you do as a metal drummer? But you like, you play all sorts of stuff. So it's like, it's yeah, just- I really enjoy the people that don't know me that call me a metal drummer. <laughs> that's like, that really makes me laugh at this point in my life. Cause I, 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 I feel like I live in two worlds. Like I live in this world where I play drums on everyone's record and like, no one knows that I play on a bunch of metal bands. <laughs> and then I live in this world where I play in a bunch of like metal prog bands and they get confused that I like do other things. Right. It, it's like you have to really funny one personality for some reason. <laughs> yeah, it's really funny to me. It makes me laugh like every day. And it's funny because like, especially now with Brand of Sacrifice, like absolutely blowing up. Yeah. Uh, like I'm now like a deathcore drummer, which I didn't know what deathcore was like a year ago. So <laughs> like, I think that's funny. Right. Uh, but I mean... <laughs> I, I mean, if I could just be a metal drummer, I don't even think I would do that because it's like not about like, I mean, yeah, I, I mean, playing all those other genres, you know, like pays my bills and stuff. But right. it's also like, I don't like, I've got, I've got a lot of things that I need to feel in a month. And like, if I don't, I just feel I'm just like, not a complete person. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, you know, it's just like, I want, I want to play on a R&B record and a death metal record and like a radio rock record in the same month. Like I, those are things I want to do because I like all those styles of music. And if I made a record with all those styles of music in it, no one would listen to it. So, (laughs) (laughs) so it makes more sense to just do it all separate, you know, like, so. Yeah. Well, that's kind of how I feel being here that, you know, I'll get a client who comes in, you know, I'm meeting them for the first time. I'm hearing their song for the first time. And it's like, you know, if usually if I'm not getting a preview of the song, it's it's not it's not so it crazy that I can't like, you know, hear it, pick up on the form and start tracking something. Um, and I've had it, you know, it, it seems like every time I sit down and they're like, oh, OK, he's going to track piano. Cool. And then, you know, my friend Kevin, who, who usually engineers the sessions, will be like, yeah, you know, it would sound great. Like if we added some kind of like, you know, like some warmer color, like let's let's try the roads. And then I get on the roads and they're like, wait, it, he's the same guy. And it's like, uh, yeah, the, it's it's the same. You know, it's like slightly different, but it's it's still. Yeah. Like <laughs> they're like, but yeah. I thought you were just a, a pianist. I'm like, no, I like I I don't know how to play, you know. Like, if if it was me or a gospel organist, like I don't know how to work the stops as well yet, or play with you know the feet as as clean. But I can still, you know, do a little bit of what I know on organ or on Wurlitzer or on, you know, just random synths and. Um, and it's if you would have you know listened to some of the recordings i did last year for some reason last year was the you know hey dutcher record ragtime dandies like i had so <laughs> many, i had probably like 10 different clients who were just like yeah could you do some like you know like jazzy like ragtime <laughs> and i'm like i've never this is literally like the least i've recorded of this and i, I don't know where they heard me do it where <laughs> 
they they're like, yeah, th- he could do it, and it's yeah, it's just funny that. I mean, I think a lot of that stuff though, just it doesn't. People that work with you or with anyone that's competent, you know, they 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 work with you because they know that you're good, right. and so it doesn't like if they know that you can do one thing well, they just assume that you can do the other thing well, which is generally correct, right? Because it's not like, it's not like those two things are, I mean, if you want to get into like the nitty gritty of like, yeah, how those things are different, you can, you know what I mean? But usually people that are asking both of those things aren't asking you to go on like a, you know, a giant, you know, pilgrimage through all of the different niches in those genres to be able to put together a 32 bar, you know, a B section for a a thing in that style. You know what I mean? It just comes with like, if someone works with you enough, they're like, okay, this guy like knows his shit. Right. So anything that I give him will be like, I'm fine. You know what I mean? Yeah, which I think is good. That speaks speaks to the quality of your work, and it's also like, you know, it means that you can communicate properly that you're not a shithead. So <laughs> <laughs> that's like ha- I feel like that's how most or how like when I give advice to like some of the, you know, I get a question of like, hey, like how how do you get like I see you doing this, like how do you get to that point where you're doing that? It's like, well, I, you know, I've I've built a lot more bridges then i don't even know like i don't even know what's technically a burned bridge it's like maybe like young mistakes where i've like double booked something and it's yo that take sucks get the fuck out of my house i think that's how you do it (laughs) (laughs) get out of here yeah it that that's never i've never had anyone like blown up in in my face for like something i've contributed to but you know I, i i it's like the I don't know the Michigan there's the Michigan politeness of like <laughs> interacting with people and sometimes there has to be that you know discernment of like or or being honest as a musician and being like yeah you know I do need to work on certain aspects of my playing and that's why you know certain things are still like just out of my my reach like if I'm you know if you're not confident on your instrument it's going to be hard to do session work unless you can find another way of like, oh, but he's really prolific as an arranger, so he can like at least dictate something. <laughs> um, I don't know. It's it's music's got so many, you know. There's there's no real like. I, I was talking with someone the other day about like music's the a weird thing to try and have a, like a five year plan for, because five <laughs> years ago I didn't know how to do live sound, and now everyone knows I do that now. <laughs> So it's, yeah, it's like, where do you see yourself in five years? Well, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to be at this high school doing a choir accompanying job. And I, th- and I think I'm going to be there for another year until I get an offer to go do my master's. And then the month after I'm in Massachusetts, I'm going to move to a new city and do a degree and then work at a brewing company doing live sound, which I don't know how to yeah, do. Yeah, man, you can totally plan that. Yeah, it's all, it's all here in my... <laughs> My five-year plan. Well, I think the 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 most successful plans or whatever, if you want to call it a plan, it 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 doesn't come from it being a plan. Yeah. I I don't think, at least for me, it was never. And people that I've looked up to that have been asked similar questions like this, it's never been like a plan of in five years I want to do a full U S tour or something. It's always been, I don't care what I'm doing when I'm doing it, as long as I'm playing drums or as long as I'm playing music. Mm-hmm. And so as long as you're doing those things, it doesn't really matter. Like it, I mean, I, cause you know, it, it making a plan like that where it's like, so arbitrary, like, well, it's year four and I'm, I'm not on my jet getting yeah. ready to go to do my Brazil tour, you know, is like, so, that's just so disheartening because like, you know, and also too, like 
just i mean especially for me like i still pretty much entertain every offer of anything i get asked to do because it's like well i mean shit like am i like (laughs) like this is this isn't like in my wheelhouse or this isn't in my like vision of how i see james canoral but like right who the hell cares? Like, I just do it because it'll be fun. And it's like, I don't have to go to, you know, I don't have to get up at 9am and hate my job. I get up whenever I want and I go to work whenever I want. And I just work until I don't want to anymore because I don't think it's work. <laughs> like, yeah. like, it's like, I play drums. Like, yeah. yeah like, <laughs> and so I think like, if you keep it, I mean, at least for me, it, keeping it open ended makes it it makes it a lot easier on yourself because you're not like you know setting these goals of like you know whatever like I want to be making a hundred thousand dollars as a musician in five years. It's like well, first of all, good luck. Yeah. And second of all, like what? Like okay, so go get a music business job and you'll never play music (laughs) you know what i mean like yeah yeah, i don't know i like anytime someone asks me about that kind of stuff where it's like how did you get to like where you are that kind of stuff i i'm always just like dude like it doesn't matter like right because like my path is not gonna be the same as yours and it's like it's not even worth your effort to to try no, not because like what I did is astounding because there's a plenty of musicians that make a living, but like, it's just like, you know, like it's, it's not a straight path. It's like, it's like a freaking like Mario Kart level, dude. Like it's all over the damn rainbow place. It's road. like rainbow road, but with your <laughs> career trajectory, like, you know, like, and it's so like, it's so difficult to, to communicate that to someone that's like on the on the starting lap you know it's just like dude like you'll understand it when you get there you know what i mean and like you know what i'm talking about because it's like like you just said you know it's like do a choir thing and then do a founders thing then i might do this then i might do that i have no idea and like yeah part of that's like the the joy of it i mean i like seriously if i and there's no disrespect to people that have normal nine to five jobs but if i out of college took a job that I knew I was going to be at until I was 65 and retire, I would lose my mind. Like that sounds like just like prison that I'm entering on my own free will. Like, (laughs) no, thank you. You know what I mean? Like I would rather just like worry about the different things that go along with being an independent freelance musician, you know, my own insurance, all that crap. Yep. frivolous crap that doesn't matter to be like oh yeah okay uh what do i do for work today um gonna track a hip-hop song and uh play drums okay <laughs> sick gonna eat dinner at 10 and it's gonna be awesome like i don't know it just makes it easier for me to sleep at night it's just like not having to you know the, i think it's also just like another thing that like my father kind of instilled in me, which ended up being complete horse shit, which I always bring up to him because I think it's hilarious. Um, was like when I was a kid, he was like, you know, cause I was the same way when I was in high school was just like, I'd practice until four in the morning. I'd like go to bed when my dad was like getting up. And after this happening for a couple of months, my dad was like, James, you know, like, you know, like, it's cool that you're doing this now, but like, you you know, like when you get older, you're going to have to make a routine and you're probably going to have to like cut your hair to get a job. And I was like, I was like, I mean, this was way before I had really decided that I wanted to like be a musician full time, but like, I always bring that up to him now at this point. Cause I'm like, Oh, Hey, uh, I'll like call him or whatever and be like, Hey, uh, just want to let you know, uh, don't have anything on my calendar today because you don't have a routine and uh my hair is getting pretty long <laughs> <laughs> and i have a beard now so i'm definitely not employable to like anyone that's looking for a, 
a white collar uh, <laughs> worker. So yeah, it's so that 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 yeah, definitely I get grieved about my hair as well. Like just as a symbol of like, hey, you know, like you know, if you just maybe you'd get this kind of work if you like had it styled or like has it's like I I'm already doing. Like the reason why it's so messy is because I don't have time to like, you know, I, or I, maybe, you know, I, I could say like, oh, I don't schedule a salon thing, but I'm also like too focused on, you know, coming up here, doing work. I know, you know, after this, I'm going to go back home and probably work on some video editing because I have a batch of podcasts and I'm doing a, a project with my cousin that involves like editing a lot of found footage and into some kind of you know, visual narrative of sorts. And it's like, I've never done that, but <laughs> I've, I, you know, it's a project with my cousin. So it's, it's a little less intense than, you know, having some company reach out. But um, yeah, it's, I agree that the fact that, it, you know, especially having, you know, no founders, not a, you know, not a lot of things to do, last year that were other people telling me like, Hey, you got to show up at this time, do this, and then you'll get paid. It was like that realization of like, Oh, I do like working for myself and I'm a better boss than I was when I was like 20. Yeah. <laughs> like, I'm not gonna just like, you know, keep spinning my wheels and like, Oh, I'm just gonna, you know, maybe if I just work every day until super late, something will happen. It's like, yes and no like one thing's gonna happen is you're gonna get super tired and you might get burnt out for a little bit but other thing that might happen is you you know kind of show up and do the work that's needed for all the things you said yes to and you've learned to say no to some things in the future <laughs> but um i would say that the one thing that i learned about uh um like burnout is okay at least in my, like my life, like I did this thing last month where I made a YouTube video for every day of the month. Okay. And I did it solely just as a project of, cause I knew, I knew by the middle of the second week, I was going to hate it. I like knew I was going to hate it because like, I don't like, it's just, a, it's just, a, I mean, it's a lot of work. Yeah. So, uh, but I did it more as an exercise of like maintaining stress and like kind of pushing through burnout. Because I think at least for me, like burnout is to me kind of just is, it seems optional. Yeah. Like if you say you're burnt out, it just means at least in, at least for me, I can't speak for everyone, but at least when I say like, I, I think I've only said the word, like I've, I'm burnt out like three times mm -hmm. because I just realized that like, I'm not actually burnt out. I've just haven't found a new way to get motivated or inspired by whatever it is I'm supposed to be working on. Yep. So it's like, how, how do I get there? Like, how do I find a new way to get into this piece of music or whatever? that isn't, you know, the way that I've been doing it the past, you know, four weeks or what, or whatever duration of time, you right. know? And I think that, and I think kind of creating those like personal mental challenges, I kind of like to do this a lot, but it's like creating that like personal mental challenge of like, are you going to do this thing? No matter how much it sucks, you're going to find a way to get it done. And like by doing those kind of exercises, it's really kind of enlightening to figure out ways to like, all right, I like, you know, f for example, it was like one night I was just like grinding it out until like three in the morning. And I was like, I, I literally hate this. This is horrible. And, you know, sometimes the, the answer is just like, all right, maybe you need to take an hour break or, you know, like maybe you need to not look at this as practice or like, what if you drink a couple beers while you're doing this? Like you haven't done that. I haven't done that in a long time. Yeah. Maybe do that. Or like, maybe be like, you know what? 
I'm just going to listen to the music that I'm working on while I play video games or going to go like, you know, there's just like, for me, there's so many ways to, I mean, and there's also probably so many ways that I haven't even like explored this, but like, there's so many ways to kind of beat burnout that just isn't like getting, you know, for me, like, letting burnout win is just like letting me sit on my couch for three days and watch Netflix or something. You know what I mean? Because I'm the kind, I mean, I'm the kind of person that's like, I don't have an off switch in terms of like, Oh shit. Like I have to be, I should be working on this thing right now. Yeah. But if I can think about it as a way that's like, I'm going to spend today playing PlayStation one games so that way tomorrow when I go in, I will be more energized to do the work that I wouldn't do as well if I did it today. Yep. You know what I mean? And just like stuff like that. And just because you, one of the things that you're mentioning about like being your own boss is, well, if you're your own boss and you're also a hard ass, you're not going to give yourself any days off. No. <laughs> I literally like, I'm so bad about it. Like I, I mean, my girlfriend's bad about it too. I think that's why like I work every day is just because like, I don't have, you know, weekends. I mean, weekends used to be, I used to work on weekends anyways. Yeah. Because we used to play shows on weekends. So it was never like, it's not like I was ever used to having a full weekend off anyways. So now it's just kind of been, you know, dialed into whatever other stuff, but yeah, I think that, that like what you were saying about like the burnout kind of stuff is like a good way for me to kind of surpass it. And also with like, you know, the, whatever seasonal depression and COVID related social depression is just like, yep. which has kind of helped me with it. It's just like constantly kind of creating like an, my own like mental challenge about it, like in my brain, which is just like, all right, like you're going to be inside, like you might as well get something done because otherwise you're going to just feel like garbage about it anyways, you know? Like if you're going to feel like garbage regardless, you might as well feel good about something you did while you feel like garbage. <laughs> yeah, because it is, that. that's one thing I've, I've been working out over the last, you know, probably since, because like, March and April are such kind of like limbo months of like, what's opening up is something, am I going back to work in May? Is it still going? Like, we don't know. So remember when we thought we were all going back to work in May? (laughs) God. Nope. (laughs) Oh my God. (laughs) Yeah. That, uh, I, I remember that so vividly because I was like, you know, last year was going to be, it it was at the top of the year, like, you know, I I was doing another residency with West Shore Community College, working with their musical, and then I went to the NAM show for the first time, and I like you know had all these things that were like, all right, this is gonna be the year. Like, I'm gonna you know I'm gonna do more traveling. I'm gonna I'm gonna see more music. I had tickets to like you know Rage Against the Machine and Tigran and Jacob Collier and Thundercat and just like just a slew. and you went in, dude. Yeah, and then like, well, it's it's all gone. And I think the only one that got rescheduled, Tigrins, I think, is still rescheduled in Chicago. But uh, and then like Jacob Collier's doing something that I think only he can do, which is listing the cities that he was going to go to, and then selling tickets to shows that don't exist in those cities to fans. <laughs> and it's like when this open, we'll tell you, you know, Detroit when this opens up and we're able to tour again your ticket will be valid for whatever date. <laughs> wow. That's weird. Yeah. Um, but what was the last show you saw then? Uh, the last show I would say the last show that I watched where I wasn't, it wasn't me on a stage. It wasn't me in the pit for the musical. It might've been at the Nam show. Wow. Which it, <clears throat> then it was like, I think it was, you know, I don't remember the exact order of like, oh, yeah, the first day was because I remember I remember some of it like the the first day animals as leaders was like the 
they played the Yamaha stage outdoors, um, and they were the kickoff band for the the first night. But you know, I think it might have been seeing like it, it was either like Ghost Note at the Korg booth or. Um, which would have been like, you know, a 30 or 40 minute set and, or it was seeing, um, Tower of Power or no Tower of Power. I saw them, but, uh, Earth, Wind and Fire, uh, at the Yamaha stage and just being like, these guys still have, (laughs) like, they can still put on a good show. They have some great players in the band and (laughs) everyone's like a thousand years old, I think. (laughs) There's a clip of like someone took a clip of that that show and you know partway into I think when they were singing September one of the you know original dudes one of the singers he he just hit this high note in like the stratosphere and I was like how you're like how did you do that you're in your like 60s <laughs> but yeah it might it might have been that because that st- stands out as like I I saw more performances rather than just being at event, yeah, just like being there. Yeah. But yeah. What did you, did you like have, I don't know, a the, show during that time? The last show I saw um, before the pandemic was Opeth at the Apollo. Ooh. Yeah. <laughs> that was their last show of that tour. Oh wow! Because Michael got uh, laryngitis. Wow! And like that was the last show of that tour, and I remember seeing it. I remember it was me and my girlfriend and one of my friends went, and it was just like so good. It was just so good. <laughs> and then like that was I think it was February twenty seventh, and oh. then the next week. I, I guess all right. So actually, I guess the last like thing i went to was book of mormon then oh whoa yeah i saw book of mormon the day before because i because i played a show the last show i played was with jason quee we opened for haken and the contortionist in uh, richmond okay yep so i saw book of mormon then got up at like six in the morning to drive to richmond and like rehearsed with him and then played the show and then drove back the next day but like it was one of those things where it was like the next day i think like the world was fine for like two or three more days and then i remember like as soon as columbia closed down it was like oh okay uh this is weird <laughs> <laughs> but yeah i guess it was book of mormon then so wow book of mormon and opeth <laughs> definitely like a interesting combination of memories. well again it's back to like the stanley clark and mashuga thing you know it's <laughs> like like i don't judge right everything yeah so. it's yeah <laughs> well and i think i i'm i'm curious to see because i've i've noticed i i on you know the solo podcast i do i talked last week and a little bit on the episode that'll come out this sunday um of audience archetypes and just like the people I see, like there's, there's this type of person at every show you're ever going to play. And I'm seeing these people again, now that I'm, you know, playing something on a regular basis and some people are expecting it and some people don't expect it. And, you know, it's like you're midway through a song and someone stumbles over to ask for a request and you're like, I'll I'll see what I got. I I don't really know Elton John by heart. And then they, they're like, I hear he's got a song called Piano Man. He's like, uh, no, he, uh, <laughs> wait, he doesn't, that's not his song. It's like, you know, people just kind of appear and they're like, I want, that, that's not the music. This is the music. Go play, go play that. And then I'm just in the middle of a song like, okay, sure, maybe. You want to tip me? I don't know. <laughs> well, I mean, the drunk. The drunk bros and the drunk chicks just they just age up. They just you know, they like they're still the same person. They just yeah. they're just older and, and and not wiser, but they're just older. Right. It yeah, it's it's telling of like 
you know, people's enthusiasm for live music is all different. It's like, oh, I could f- finally, I could go out and do the, you know, get drunk and just like, you know, interact whether it's good or bad with what's happening. <laughs> yeah. And that was, you know, that's such a small moment, but like, it, it just got me thinking of like, it's like, you know, I, it's funny how like people, people all have like, you know, they think of, like oh i talked to the you know she probably just thought or maybe not even remembered that she did that but uh she might have just thought like oh this you know i'm talking with the music like i like to i like hearing the music but i was i was you know i like this song and then a a dude at the table next to her party came over and was like hey man whatever you're playing sounds great here's here you go and i was like cool (laughs) (laughs) Like you're the yin to the yang, and <laughs> we're all back out here doing doing the live music thing. Like we're figuring it out again together. <laughs> How to be? Um, yeah, because I, I, you know, I, and I'm at a point too where it's like I don't, I don't need, you know, I understand like what my role is if I get in a venue and it's not like everyone's staring at me. Um, so it's not like I expect people who are like there to relax and have dinner are gonna be like, oh wow, that, that was a man. That sound that that tune was hip, man. <laughs> like I <laughs> that in school of just like, bro, that was hip. It's like you weren't there. Nah, man, it was killing. I didn't see you in the audience. <laughs> but it's yeah, it's just funny. Like, like doesn't matter what type of gig you do. You just there's always gonna be that you know, these different types of the same kinds of people at every show. And it's like, oh, okay, I don't have to, like, you know, put too much thought into how I interact with people because everyone's going to interact different. (laughs) Yeah. Totally agree with that. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, I can't imagine, like, being in Boston for that long. I mean, I, I don't, I've only known Boston for the, like, the tiny little slivers of time I've been in there, like when I was auditioning and then with my uncle who lives in, lives in Gill, um, but studied at uh, UMass Amherst. And I think he went to, uh, did he go to Boston university? He, he did a, his bachelor's and master's in Boston and or maybe his doctorate also. I don't know. He's a music nerd, but he, uh, I I know at least from what I gather it's like everyone everyone's kind of down to just like it, it felt very in the moment like yeah we're just gonna have beers go here I don't really know you but let's let's hang <laughs> like yeah I mean the thing with Boston is it's it's a giant college community so it's a lot of kids I mean like I played in I played in cover bands the whole time I lived in Boston just because the money was good and like it was always fun like i always had fun yeah um but uh it takes a certain kind of person to like like that environment all the time uh i mean i had to kind of like make some games in myself to like kind of maintain sanity because it's you know it's like one thing it's like you know you know, it, like I'll have a beer or two while I'm playing, but it's like, you know, I got to play and I got to drive home. So it's like, yeah. I can't, you know, trying to communicate to a giant room of drunk people without being drunk is like, you're someone's mom, you know, like trying to like talk to their, like, you know, whatever. Yeah. So it's just like, but that being said, I've never like, I, I thought that like the Boston, you know as a whole the boston like live cover band scene is pretty vibrant and pretty pretty hardcore um so i mean i had fun (laughs) (laughs) i mean i won't ever do it again but i had fun (laughs) yeah you you had your time and it's like all right now i'm you're you're where you're in new york city or like yeah i live in so my apartment is in manhattan and my studio is in brooklyn okay so is that like i'm trying to think of the 
I've I've been playing the new Spider Man, but I know it's like a thirteen mile bike ride one way. Oh, okay. So my uh, my legs get pretty worked out every day, but <laughs> but it's good. Um, I mean it's a beautiful bike ride. I I bike across the river every day, so like oh nice. It's not like it's not like I'm biking through the street. New York's great with uh bike paths and stuff like that so it's it's pretty dope um but my studio is nice um it's definitely like the best studio space i've been in because i've been yeah i mean i've been doing the the rehearsal space lockout rooms since i was like 18 you know like (laughs) and i've been doing that grind for almost 10 years so uh, when I moved here, I got one space and then there ended up being a bunch of like issues with the building and like it was leaking a lot. So this summer I actually moved to, I used to be in Queens. My studio was in Queens, but then I moved to Brooklyn. So I'm, I mean, I'm assuming I'll be there for the end of time until I like move out of New York or something. I don't know, but it's yeah it's pretty sick so i have no i have no complaints i have a window so like that's for someone that's been in basement studios in like warehouse spaces and now now i finally have a place that's like a giant brick wall and a window i'm like happiest guy so (laughs) i can't really complain too much and it's just me too i don't share it with anybody so that's good that's like the other thing that i really like is i just don't i don't share it with people not because I don't like sharing, but because I don't like sharing. <laughs> <laughs> Not because I don't like, you know, having people have access to all my stuff all the time. But well, it's also, too, it's just, you know, like if I'm, you know, charging people money to do a record. And I'm, you know, I'm not going to do the whole record in a day because I want it to be done right. right. I can't have people coming into my spot and, you know, bumping a microphone and stuff because then it's not that's not what people are paying for they're paying for studio quality stuff you know so that i mean that that's partially the reason why i don't share but the other reason is i have way too much stuff like i have way too much stuff like when we moved here we moved my studio separately from our apartment so like we had we bought we rented a u-haul for my studio then moved here moved into the studio came back to boston packed up the apartment and then u-hauled the apartment in another u-haul and originally we were thinking oh yeah i'll fit in one u-haul we'll be fine there's no way in hell it would have fit in one u-haul <laughs> there's no way in hell so and that would have been really embarrassing because like megan's parents came out to help us move and it would have just been like my stuff had we moved both things at one time. (laughs) So they would have just been like, wow, uh, Megan, you sure about this guy? He's got a lot of things. He's got a lot of stuff. So that's, that's kind of where like I'm at in terms of there's certain things I, you know, each month I'll kind of like fill a little thing with like, I don't really need these things anymore. And I figure out like, okay, I can, you know, get rid of these, uh, you know, sell them on Craigslist or something or take stuff and a lot of stuff to donate. And uh, when the pandemic hit there, you know, some people were like, yeah, man, you know, like if you're worried about rent, like, you know, your lease doesn't your lease end soon, you can move back in with your folks. I'm like, we are so far past that now. (laughs) Yeah, right. And so much like I can't uh, like, hey, mom. um, So, you know, I got a, a, a like a you know, a, a 73 student model Rhodes, a spinet piano, you know, like three keyboards, a synth, like my computer stuff, my audio stuff, my vinyl collection, CDs, video games, my bed. You have a life. Yeah. It's like, can I just move? I just need a little bit of the whole floor of a house. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I like, if Megan tomorrow was like, I hate you leave. I like, it would just, 
it's just so much it's just yeah you know like yeah there's so much to, not like, not like, possible i just like pass out and just like well uh. <laughs> yeah <laughs> well that's been the spot for the past two years so um nice and it's uh treated me well um got the window i like I'll, new york's got a great vibe so like it's also nice to like have that you know like i was saying before just like that uh kind of space out time like you know because it takes me about an hour to get to the studio right but like you know i like talk on the phone a lot in that time and then i also like you know listen to whatever music i have to track that day or i'll just listen to like a podcast or i'll just listen to nothing <laughs> and it but it's just like it's it's nice to have that especially now that it's like nice out mm -hmm. nice to have that time to just kind of like hang out you know like yeah you can't you can't like i can't feel bad about not doing something because i'm like literally on my way to do something so right. it's like it's honestly the most like relaxing part of my day is like getting on my bike so yeah it's definitely that's how i feel about my drives it's you know i it's usually like i i have like that you know part in the morning where it's like a relaxing drive i'm not stuck in like the morning rush of any yeah time. yeah and then coming home it's like I'm, it's usually after rush hour um and sometimes it's late enough where it's just like okay there's me and like a couple cars on the road and i i can just like throw on a podcast or you know yeah listen to nothing <laughs> yeah i mean the, the one thing i like about bike traffic in new york city is like it doesn't really matter what time of day it is it's not like it doesn't impact my travel time because right. like i don't care if it's 5 p.m like i'm not driving where the cars are driving so i don't care yeah so but i mean my hours are like i mean especially since i'm in like major practice tracking mode right now my hours are so messed up that it's like you know i don't even know i probably won't go to the studio today but like i just do like i'll go normally i'll go at like noon and i'll come home at like 10 or something yep so it's like yeah. not it's probably not healthy but whatever <laughs> yeah i'm I mean, over it it's yeah it's like for me too is like having the energy i i the you know the video stuff that i do that's you know it's it's been a thing i've done more recently in the last year um and it's very you know very basic not not anywhere near close to like you know like oh i'm color correcting a bunch of stuff and i'm like shooting different footage angles and i'm like rendering a lot of different clips it's you know it's pretty basic audio video sync and then like you know usually i'd if it's if it's like social media related i'll just like you know toss it into an app that throws a filter on it and then post it just to like save time but um i yeah it, i i get that mix of like having those days where i can do like you know i i got up at mm. like i think a friday it's like i got up at you know seven or eight and then i drove out to the studio I did some work before a client came in to have me record some things. I spent like two or three hours doing that. And then, um, you know, had to leave the studio and go directly to uh, the listening room to, you know, get there early. It was the first weekend with the trio, you know, make sure they know where they're going, get them in there, <laughs> make sure everyone's comfortable and set up and, and then do you know like six to nine and then leaving you know because some friends showed up it's like okay chat with them for a bit you know leaving the venue at 10 going home and then spending three hours like editing and rendering a video <laughs> and just being like okay i did a lot to, okay that's good uh, cool and then i did i probably did that you know i did that a little bit saturday too and and sunday and um i know there's certain things that are like that are more pressing now that it's march it's like oh there's things coming up but i also know that 
you know, give me a chunk of a day, I can get it done in that day early. It's just making finding that day that <laughs> Yeah, for sure. Just in like boom, I'm ready to just like knock this out and not and tune out the whole world for, you know, four or five hours, six hours, <laughs> however long it's gonna take. Um but yeah, I feel that like trying to trying to do well, I don't even know if it's like trying to do the work cuz I've I've already proven to every person that's ever met me that I can work hard. <laughs> but, you know, finding that ability to like do the now it's just like getting the work done in like smarter chunks cuz I know I'm going to do the work, but I don't necessarily need to like, you know, do it all in one day. <laughs> yeah, do it do it all in yeah. one day. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, yeah. So, you know, it's having me rethink a little bit of how my evening's going to go. Cause the weather's been getting nicer here too. And I kind of want to like, you know, I live close to Riverside park, which. Is hey, like, I live close to a Riverside park too. Yeah. <laughs> it, we're Riverside the same park. It's like right there. We're the same. It's the same place. Grand Rapids is just, li- <laughs> just like New York. We got a park. We got, there's musicians. <laughs> Overpriced rent. Yeah. That's a, that's creeping, you know, the, we, we got a poke bowl shop with some lobster. Oh, 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 oh. We're getting there. Dang, dude. You better look out. Once you guys get that Whole Foods, it's over for you. Yeah, I, I am so, like, we're, we have, like, you know, the Bridge Street Market and the Downtown Market are both, like, bougie, fancy markets that, you know, people from ada and east grand rapids and like you know the surrounding wealthy chunks of communities all come into downtown for and it's like all right when's you know someone's gonna buy that and turn it into another expensive spot with expensive housing (laughs) i love that stuff (laughs) love that stuff it's my favorite part of a a growing city because apparently grand rapids is like not only is grand rapids whatever you know because some of those articles are like, oh, they paid to be featured in a top 10 list or something. But like it's on lists of like best place to raise a family. And then my zip code in particular is like the best spot for a new family. So there's I've been seeing people buy houses all in my neighborhood the last couple of years. And it's just like we're we're growing. We're, good, we're getting there. We're, it's, I mean, Grand Rapids has been on the up and up for a long time. I mean, I remember like when I moved to Cadillac and my dad, one of my dad's offices is in Grand Rapids. And I remember going down there a lot more for shows and stuff when I was in high school. I just remember it like progressively, like every time I go down there just be like, there's more stuff happening. And then like, I mean, especially when, when the beer scene exploded in the country, I feel like Grand Rapids really kind of expedited its growth because like, something with grand rapids and people liking beer that just like really because i mean there's so many beer spots in grand rapids that it just like really helped (laughs) yeah it's it's uh you know and having you know grown up in the city it's it's i definitely see the the you know both sides of the coin of like some people feeling like they're pushed out to the the outskirts of the city and then other people who are like this is kind of what i've wanted from a city like a little bit more yeah you know more things to do certain infrastructure things are you know being updated like they fix the like the interchange between 131 and 196 which was always like a cluster mess of just (laughs) everything and all these cars just having to inter intersect and you know lanes being you know just the risk of an accident was always at that interchange and they like rebuilt that highway. (laughs) Um, But yeah, I mean, I've heard, it's funny how many people I've talked to recently that I've, I've caught up with who have moved to Brooklyn. (laughs) Brooklyn's the spot, man. I mean, I'd live in Brooklyn if we didn't have the reason we live in Manhattan is because Megan's doing her PhD at Columbia. So we get Columbia like dummy discounted housing it's fine. i mean everything i like is in brooklyn anyways 
So like, I mean, upper upper west side's cool. It's, I mean, there's cool spots, but like, I don't. It's not my scene. Like, it's a lot of bougie adults with their, you know, like mid thirties people that like want everyone to know they have a lot of money kind of stuff. And I'm just, that's not my, that's not, I'm not really interested in that. I mean, there is a lot of really cool before the pandemic, there was a lot of really nice bars around here that had a cool, like kind of uh circle of regulars that were cool. But, but I mean, like, I mean, when I lived in Boston and I uh, would come here to visit friends that lived in Brooklyn, I would just be in Brooklyn and like, there are spots in Brooklyn that I hold near and dear to my heart. So it's just, you know, if we, you know, if, if we end up staying here, we'll probably end up buying a place in Brooklyn, you know, just not Brooklyn proper, but maybe like Bushwick or bed or Gowanus or Lefferts or something. But yeah, all real places. I totally know about now. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, there's like so many mid neighborhoods of Brooklyn. So like Brooklyn yeah. proper is like, really damn expensive and like not necessary because it's just like it's like you know like who wants to live in like well apparently a lot of people do but like living in midtown manhattan where like times square is like i don't i don't even like going there biking through there like let alone live there so there's like it's not really that comparable but like a mini version of that is like downtown brooklyn you know it's like right i don't care about that rather i'd rather live like in the city but like be able to have like a semblance of a yard or something i don't i don't know like yeah one can dream <laughs> yeah it's kind of a, a, that's partially why I, you know as i'm thinking about like where what i want to do when things open up again or where i get a little bit more income um the like i've enjoyed aspects of the crested neighborhood because i you know it's close enough to the highway where i, I feel like i can you know, leave my house and be on my way much sooner than living in other parts of the city. Um, but you don't really hear the highway that much. And it's also close, you know, for this listening room gig, it's like I get in my car and I drive like less than 10 minutes and I'm downtown. And Can't I'm beat parked. that, dude. <laughs> it's like, Can't beat it. That's like, you know, because I had the thought of like, oh, if I lived in Grand Haven, I could work more at the studio, but it you know, the cost of living in Grand Haven is like double what <laughs> it is in Grand Rapids. So I'd, you know. Hey, you know, the thing that I always like, the whole thing, another thing that brings me back to like the work in the nine to five is like, you know, how many years people spend like commuting by the end of their life? It's like, it was, it, I think the statistic was like something insane. It was like five to seven years. Yeah. Your life you spend commuting. <laughs> like, <laughs> God, so no. Uh, you know like yeah so damn it better at least be a nice commute or a short like there better be some other aspect to it that is not just i am traveling to get from point a to point b like there better be like it's a gorgeous commute or it's short (laughs) (laughs) you know yeah and when and especially with michigan it's like you know two and a half hours east you're in detroit two and a half hours north you're in traverse city you know roughly and then for some reason it's like six hours you're in marquette but i don't go there that often. yeah i mean it's, i don't think there's a lot of gigs up in the up no I, I don't know i haven't played i've never played in the up so i i played i played two nights at this spot called Ordock brewing and they have you know they they know they're in the middle of you know they're the they're the city in this giant oasis of like just wilderness and and they uh they book bands for you know like oh you could do two nights and then you know there's places you can stay and um that was fun uh we kind of turned it into like it, it was earth radio two nights and then we did like the um the Marquette food co-op was doing like a Sunday series where they would give you like a hundred dollar store credit to do like an hour of music in their little like dining nook that was like near the entrance of the store. And we just like did like hand percussion keys and like just un unmiked vocals. (laughs) 
and use the money to like buy food for the for the uh the bands like we, we were staying an extra couple days so it's like oh we got some money for food for the rest of our time up here that's sick but yeah it's i don't know I, I i do like those that's that's one thing i'm trying to figure out with booking the band we we had some chats today about like what our plan is with the band because our drummer it sounds like he's going to be moving to nashville to finally link up with the warren treaty um because he had auditioned for the band at the end of 2019 and and he was supposed to like tour with them last year and then all of that got pushed um and they're you know they were going to do a, a co co bill with john legend and like I don't know, go to Europe and <laughs> just all. Oh, yeah. So we're like, awesome. But we also need to figure out, <laughs> like, we have a drummer that, you know, David is a great drummer and he he fits right in. But it's like, he lives in Ipsy, so there's that time difference of like, okay, is he going to be able to drive out to do rehearsals? Or like, is he going to move to this side of the state? It sounds like he might do that, but I don't know. I All those logistic things are like, like, let's just start with, can we play anywhere first? <laughs> is there anywhere open that isn't just, you know, nervous about like, you know, I, I, people that already know the band are going to be like, oh, yeah, we'll find some time. But people who have no idea, they're going to double down on like, well, this singer, you know, like she brings like 15 of her friends and we can only have like 30 people in our cafe. So, yeah, yeah, <laughs> but uh, yeah, I, I have to begrudgingly start the booking process again of just being like, hey, is I, the last time I talked to someone, it was Mike. Does Mike still work there? <laughs> no? Okay, who who is it? And then I have to wait for them to respond. <laughs> but, yeah, I'm so glad I'm not going to be doing any of that for a long time or ever. <laughs> ever. Yeah, you got, you got the 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 bands that 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 know that you're gonna show up and smash some drums and but you're well not... i mean <laughs> well brand brand we just signed to agi booking oh nice um, so we're on like the same booking agency as like metallica and megadeth and stuff so like we don't wow. i don't have to do any of that anymore which is great uh and then gargoyle i think gargoyle is on some sort of management thing too and then aviations, I usually don't really book anything anymore unless it kind of like comes to us, which is, and that's probably going to be the, the move going forward just because I don't really know when we're going to be touring. <laughs> so. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That that's like, you know, with, with our current drummer, Madison going to the Warren treaty, like they're signed to William Morris entertainment. So they don't have to, like, I forget who I was talking to about that that didn't understand, you know, like, they didn't understand booking in terms of, like, well, okay, so they're, they're doing what you do. They they do book. It's, like, yes, but in with them, it's, like, they could just walk into a room and be, like, they're going to play what days do you have open. It's not, you know, trying to convince them that, your your art is valid it's like they have the experience and the reputation <laughs> to just kind of plug you in anywhere they can call up whatever thing that you've seen anybody do and they can just plug that person in some capacity <laughs> yeah i mean it's just a different it's just a different i mean for lack of better words just a different level of of touring so it's just like i mean those bands have paid their dues and they've got you know accreditation basically of like you know right. we have we can sell you this many tickets with this date or whatever you know so it's like way it's way less of a financial risk you know like essentially it's kind of yeah. how i how i see it but yeah and it's you know i i don't even know like that that's you know with earth radio is the things I'm doing are kind of like making sure we have a, some sort of a system of like, you know, like we make something, it kind of goes into like, okay, here's how we're distributing it. 
here's, you know, we've worked on a copyright process thing. Like, here's how we're thinking about, like, what could we, you know, we work with an artist. Like, do we want to print anything on a shirt? Or, like, what are we thinking about merch? Like, those decisions are, you know, a little more pertinent than necessarily playing because even if we – it's like we – even if we do play, there's there's not like we might sell some merch. We might you know have a decent paying thing. There's a couple gigs we have this summer that are from last year, but um, yeah, it's like trying to <laughs> trying to figure like trying to figure out music business with a band that's also learning music business. So there's no there's no expert. It's just everyone's like I kind of know how to do the books. I kind of know how to think about. <laughs> you know, trademarking, I kind of know how to, you know, think about copyright and, uh, so it'll be interesting to see. Well, I mean, it, it, you like, basically it, learn all the music business stuff the same way you learn music. You just try shit and see if it works. Yeah. <laughs> and then go from there. You know what I mean? It's not like it's, I mean, a pamphlet. <laughs> there's definitely a lot more like legalese and stuff, but it's just like, I always kind of took it the same way. You know, it's just like, same kind of stuff it's just i don't really know if this is working and then you don't know if it's working until you see the result so then you try it a different way the next time you know yeah and yeah and luckily it's like you know the band i don't think the band will ever get starved for like you know creative stuff with so many writers in the band but um yeah it's it, it and like I said earlier, it's like we're only going into our like we're coming up on our fourth year as a band, so there's still plenty of you know, we've we've got enough local momentum at least to like have the support at home while we figure out how to you know get our feet wet in other parts of the region and I don't know figure out and, and that's you know all things normal so <laughs> yeah right three years down the road probably for us. we'll see what the rest of the year brings then i guess yeah <laughs> but yeah this was uh in you know long overdue conversation i feel like we haven't chatted in a while yeah <laughs> we were in our we were in our covid holes you know <laughs> yeah just being like well do i continue to do nothing or do i do something to feel anything <laughs> 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 but um yeah thanks for you know carving out time today i'm sure you know we'll we'll chat again at some point um you've mentioned a few of your projects where can people find anything is it all in one location um i mean so like for all my session stuff it's just my website's jamescanorl.com um and then brand of sacrifice is on instagram at band brand of sacrifice metal uh we had a record come out on march 5th so we're still in first week sales records lifeblood uh we've got music videos for animal demon king altered eyes and the title track lifeblood which are all on our youtube um and then i guess my other band gargoyle which were signed to uh season of mist um, we put out a record last last year uh, on season. Um, she's out on vinyl. I don't know. If, I think we have like seven or eight vinyls left. Um, and then uh, my other band, Aviations, which is like my Berkeley project. Um, we're actually going to record a record next week. Nice. So uh, I'll be in Rhode Island for that. And uh, that band's on Instagram at Aviations Band. Um, and then I just put out a record with a band called the migraine aura mm -hmm. and I have another record coming out at the end of this month with, Oh my God, I forget the name of the band. I swear I'm not this irresponsible all the time. <laughs> I can't remember the name of the band. I have a record coming out every month for the entire year this year. Wow. So, um, and two, two this month. So that's why I forgot the second one. It's a band. India Hool is the the person that I know from that band, and Hugo Salas. Uh, I can't remember the name of their band though. I feel dumb, but <laughs> I'll send it to you. I guess I, it comes out on the twenty sixth. 
um, yeah. end I'll, of Friday, but yeah, you could send it and I'll just add a little text like pop up and yeah, like hey, I'm stupid, I forgot band names. <laughs> it's not that I don't care, it's just I'm stupid. <laughs> there's there's so much going on all of a sudden. Yeah, right. Um, no. But yeah, uh, and if for anyone listening now or after the fact, you can support these types of podcasts I do um, and other you know creative adventures I'm on. By going to patreon.com slash Dutch Snedeker, you can toss, you know, as little as five bucks to show your support and get access to episodes early, you know, merch discounts for the bands I'm in, a newsletter with like some other merch uh, available to you as patrons and um, all that good stuff. So, yeah. hell yeah. Do that if you want. <laughs> 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 but yeah. Um, there's really no ending sign off. It just kind of fades and, and then they just go. Yeah. (laughs) I just play something. I play a really loud noise to like, make sure people are listening. (laughs) Hell yeah. Well, sick. Well, perfect timing. Cause I have to run. Um, (laughs) cause I'm going on a picnic because it is nice as literal hell outside. Yeah, I'm probably going to I was going to track this this choral accompaniment, but I I can't really do it. I don't know if you can hear there's like drums being tracked. Yeah, it thing. sounds like there's some 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 booming and banging happening back there. Yeah, the the one uh the one thing about where my office is is like uh, cause third coast has studio a and B and B has a room, you know, they like to put drums in that room and then they put a hallway mic and leave, you know, leave all the doors to be open. So it's Hell yeah. goes out into the hallway and it sounds cool, but then I'm just here like, yep. Yeah. Conversation. Just, yeah. Right. <laughs> all right. It's a vibe. Yeah. But, uh, cool, yeah. Man. Awesome. Yeah, dude. I'll talk to you soon. Yeah, sounds great. Take it easy, man. Yeah, you too. All right. We did it. So if you um, want to check out any of these episodes early, again, I mentioned, you know, they'll be they'll be going up early. Uh, this week, I believe, is L Lively. Her episode is what I'm going to be working on to get finished before tomorrow and uploaded. Um, I also have, I taped a new episode of the Duchess Snedeker podcast yesterday, so that is going to be edited as well and uploaded before, ideally before Thursday. I'm trying to get everything uploaded and done on by Wednesdays of the week they come out. And then, you know, um, I have some more conversations that are in the wings. I'm going to be hopefully chatting with some folks that, you know, are going to have done small tours that are, you know, outdoor venues around the country. Um, I want to talk with some of those folks who have the ability to book these kinds of tours and see their insight on the road, how people are feeling in different parts of the country. Um, So yeah, that should be interesting to look at, but I'm going to go home (laughs) and uh you know figure out what to do from there so yeah we'll see you in the next mitten backstage episode might be a couple weeks before i do anything live 